All right, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending from where you are connected. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today and to participate uh, to uh, this uh, Skillman webinar today. Uh, let me just share my screen for all of you. Uh, in the meantime, I see that more people are connecting to the room, so in the waiting for them to to join us, uh, let, re let me remind all of you that uh, all the participants are muted and their cameras are off. Um, I suggest that we keep this um, keep it this way until uh, we get to the Q and A sessions uh, that we will be doing later on. Uh, first of all, let me just uh, give a huge thanks to the European Training Foundation. We have organized together today's webinar with them, so thank you very much for your contribution. Also, a big thanks to all the speakers that will be sharing their knowledge, their work and experience with us uh, in just uh, a while. <clears throat> okay, so uh, my name is Valentina, Valentina De Vico. I am the communication manager of Skillman. I'll be uh, with you throughout the, the whole webinar. And uh, I'm here to, uh, let's, uh, let's say, to introduce uh, today's uh, lineup of, uh, of speakers. Uh, today's event is going to be a two hours event, so we'll be staying together uh, until 4.30, so two in two hours. Um, the, the webinar today will be uh, divided into two segments, into two parts. The first part, we will have uh, Stefan Thomas, the specialist of TVET systems, uh, of the European Training Foundation, who will uh, introduce uh, work-based learning and the concept related to um, a gender perspective. Uh, after him, we'll be hearing from Fabian Scarano, a pub uh, pub uh, policy and public outreach department, uh, still from the European Training Foundation. Uh, she will be presented uh, her work of research that she's been doing uh, in work-based learning and women. Uh, and then we'll be having uh, uh, two first case studies. Uh, the one, uh, the first uh, from Albania with uh, Boraba Marjami, the line manager in work-based learning in uh, skills for jobs. And uh, the second case, studies will, case study will be uh, shared and presented by Varisto Vaya, senior partnership officer at the ADPP from Angola. Uh, after this first, uh, this first part, we will have a Q&A session uh, so we can uh, hear from you and uh, all your questions and comments. So please write them in the chat box throughout the whole, the whole webinar whenever you can. We'll be addressing the questions during uh, uh, this first uh, Q&A space. And then after the Q&A space, we will have a second part uh, with uh, Fabio Croci, Senior Project Manager of uh, CSCS. And uh, also Irina Pushak, uh, Project Manager of CSCS. And uh, they will present as uh, gender self-assessment tools for training uh, that they've been working on and testing uh, this uh, during this time. All right, so uh, moving on, I would like to um, tell all of you that today's event is part of a series of uh, technical webinars that we have been uh, uh, organizing and implementing with the European Training Foundation uh, out of this uh, partnership that we have uh, with, the, with them. And um, uh, as a co-organizers of the event, uh, Skillman is uh, regularly uh, implementing these kinds of, um, of webinars and events uh, as part of the, an international network of TVET experts, uh, industry leaders, uh, universities, uh, uh, vet institutions, and so on. And uh, we are an international network that um, was founded in 2014 with the aim of exchanging uh, skills. So skills ex exchange and introduction is the main aim of the, of the network. Uh, right now we have achieved uh, many milestones that you can see in this, uh, in this quick slide. We have uh, more than 600 members in 93 countries, so we are an international uh, network. And uh, we do a lot of initiatives, so if you want to follow um, um, our, our, our uh, upcoming events and our upcoming uh, activities, uh, please stay with us and uh, visit our webpage. Uh, I'll be moving on on this slide. 
because uh, my main contribution today is to forward you an invitation, an official invitation to our biggest annual event, the Skillman International Forum. Uh, this event uh, uh, is, is being organized every year. This year will be a hybrid event, so online and on site. And it will happen from the 15th to the 18th of November uh, this year. And of course, the European Training Foundation will contribute to the event as well with uh, webinars and other activities. And uh, this year has three main topics, uh, digital and green revolution, micro-credential and sharing is caring. So um, the, the, the topics of today will be also addressed during the, the conference. Uh, usually it's a, a large scale conference. Uh, uh, last year, we hosted um, more than 500 stakeholders from all over the world. And of course, we'll be live streamed all around the world uh, to facilitate the participation from all, from all our members and stakeholders. Um, also, um, another invitation for all of you is to join our peer learning clubs, our focus groups of experts that regularly meet up and discuss different topics around Tibet. Uh, Work-based learning is one of the topics that uh, is being addressed in these groups. So if you want, my colleague is sharing with you the link to join our uh, peer learning clubs. Uh, having said this, uh, I inform all of you that uh, we are live streaming, so the event can be watched online on our uh, skillman.eu slash live website. So if you have technical difficulties uh, or uh, if you want to watch it there, you can. And uh, last but not least, uh, we usually ask for your evaluation of the quality of the webinar. So again, this time uh, I'm going to share a link with you on the chat box uh, for all of you uh, to just take a minute of your time and tell us what you think of this webinar. I'm not going to indulge any further. I'm going to just uh, give the floor already to our first speaker, Stefan Tomas, a specialist in TV systems from the European Training Foundation. And uh, he, is, he, he will uh, introduce the, the topic and he will uh, talk about uh, web-based learning and women. Thank you, to, uh, to Stefan. The floor is all yours if you want. Thank you, Valentina. Can you hear me all well? Yes, Thank Stefan. You. So, very warm welcome also from my side. Um, I would like to welcome you all to this afternoon's webinar, which is actually part of a series of webinars on work-based learning that we to do, do together with Skillman. Valentina already mentioned that. That is a very, let's say, fruitful and uh, now already long-lasting tradition. My name is Stefan Thomas, and since 2015, I work as a specialist for work-based learning in the ETF. For those of you who do not know what is the ETF. We are an uh, agency of the European Union working in um, the areas of vocational education and training, labor market policies, or to put it maybe a little bit more generally on human capital development. This afternoon, we will um, discuss and learn about women and work-based learning, apprenticeship, internships, however we call it. We all know that work-based learning is essential, not only for students in vocational education and training, but also in higher education. The benefits for work-based learning for learners, for employers, for companies, for the society as such as a whole are well established for many years now. Work-based learning provides learners with the opportunity to develop specific skills and knowledge in the workplace and also to learn more generic employability skills, like a young woman that works in a restaurant or hotel or in an IT company, she will grow, she will be able to grow more when she has the opportunity to get to know colleagues, to get to know clients, to get to, into real work processes. That is a, a major difference between learning in a school and learning um, at the workplace. Work-based learning also offers uh, opportunities not only for professional, but also for personal development, not least for less advantaged groups. And in many countries, still young women, but also uh, female adults are still disadvantaged. We can see that clearly. Work-based learning can also facilitate the establishment of occupational or industry networks. An apprentice, an intern, a stagiaire, that has the opportunity to talk to colleagues, to clients, 
will be able to connect with other companies, with colleagues, with other apprentices and build step-by-step -step, um, a network. Vocational education and training programs that combine work-based learning and learning in the classroom, we know that from research, can lead to improved employability, faster school-to-work transition, and also better access to jobs. So uh, this is my, um, uh, my uh, thought about it. During their education and, and training programs, young people really, but this is of course also true for adults, nearly, really need to be given the opportunity to make real work experiences, not only in traditional craft trades like builders, carpenters, but also in commercial and technical professions, for instance, IT technicians, nurses, and so on. This is more and more the case for young boys and also male adults, but it seems to be less the case still for young women. As Valentina mentioned already, my colleague Fabiana Scarano will tell us a little bit more about what we know and also perhaps what we don't know. And then we will have the chance to learn more about what can be done from the two country cases. So I'm very happy that we have with us uh, from Albania, Borana Bayami, and from Angola, Efaristo Waya from ADPP Center in Angola. And he will definitely tell us what ADPP stands for because it's still a mystery for me. Uh, then finally, uh, we will have Irina Pushak and Fabio Croci that was also already announced, who will present a tool that allows institutions to self-assess strengths and weaknesses in relation to gender equality. So, and I'm very much looking forward to learn more about this tool. Um, I hope you will enjoy this webinar. Uh, that we do together with Skillman, all the discussions. Please take advantage to ask questions to our experts. And I um, hand over to Valentina and uh, Fabiana. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. As you already announced, now Fabiana Scarano who will tell us more about her research work uh, on, uh, on, on work-based learning and women. So Fabiana, if you want uh, and if you want to share your screen, uh, you're welcome to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Valentina. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, so Great. So as Valentina introduced me, my name is uh, Fabiana Scarano and I'm a trainee at the Policy and Public Outreach uh, Department of the ATF. And uh, today I'm going to give you an introduction on the topic of this webinar, so women in work-based learning, and presenting you the main findings of the research we carry out uh, that we are also going to share with you after this webinar, um, in which we try to understand which are the main factors that negatively affect women access uh, uh, and retention in work-based learning, especially in uh, male-dominated sectors, and what are the uh, more effective and meaningful solutions that can be promoted to overcome this uh, barrier and try to guarantee an increased participation of women in work-based learning. Uh, before starting, I would like to uh, ask you two quick questions just to break the ice and uh, know something more about you. Uh, so I'm going to launch a, a quick poll and uh, you will see uh, that first question is about uh, your uh, background because we would like to know uh, where do you work so we understand who, uh, which kind of audience is taking part in this webinar today. Um, Fabian, I think yeah. you can launch it if you want. Huh? Ah, okay. Ah, perfect. Yes. So I hope you can see the, the question. We give you some time to reply. So you see that you have the different options, either if you are a vet provider, you work in a company, um, government, um, or if you are part of an NGO, social partner, you can even type other in case you feel like you don't fit in any of the options offer. I see that some replies are coming. I leave you some time. More. Okay. Okay, I see just a few seconds. Okay, so we see that we have uh, half of participants. No, we have, sorry, uh, the uh, major share is from NGO. We have 
uh, 50% of people coming from an NGO. Then we have vet providers, so probably uh, experts from uh, universities, schools and centers, and also a, someone from uh, companies, no one from the governments or social partners. Okay, so I have now uh, another questions uh, for you, because before examining the topic more in depth, uh, I would like to uh, know from you uh, if you think that in your country, uh, women are encour encouraged enough to take part in a uh, work-based learning. I cannot see the second question, Valentina. I don't know if um, there is a problem with the poll. Uh, from the from the top part, there's an arrow. You just click on it and you go to the second one. I don't know why I don't have it. <laughs> I okay. can see the first question, but no problem. Case, then no then problem. we move on from. We move on. Uh, we will maybe ask you later on. Um, so now I'm going to share my, my, my presentation with you. Okay, I hope you can see it. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, uh, try to, sorry, Fabiana, try to put it on the presentation mode. Yes, it is. It's a bit uh, oh. slow. So before starting, I would like to uh, give you a brief introduction about what is work-based learning and which are its main forms. Uh, so in many countries, work-based learning represents a key component of uh, vocational education programs. It exposes learners to the real world of work by engaging them in workplace, in workplace activities and provide learners with those in demand technical skills that can facilitate a smooth transition from school to work. If uh, we look at an internal definition given by ETF, uh, we can define work-based learning as learning that occurs when people do real work in a real work environment. This work can be paid or unpaid, and it leads to the production of real goods and services. And the work may or may not be combined, but usually it is uh, with school-based learning uh, taking place either in a classroom or in a workshop. Uh, of course, there are many types of work-based learning programs, but the two main forms, the one you usually heard about the most, are apprenticeships and trainships and internships. So apprenticeships, uh, represent a major form of work-based learning. Uh, normally, they combine workplace training with school-based training, and workplace training makes up uh, the major share of the training process. Uh, these programs usually last uh, several years. For example, if you look at some of our partner countries, uh, generally they last from three to four years, and uh, uh, the apprentice usually is considered an employee. Therefore, he she receives uh, a salary and does a work contract. And uh, at the end of the program, he, she also received the recognized qualification. Uh, in contrast with apprenticeships, uh, we have trainships and internships that instead are shorter workplace training periods uh, that complement formal or non-formal education and training programs. Uh, they are less structured than apprenticeships and uh, usually last from a few days or weeks to months. And they may, may or may not include a work contract and the payment for the apprentice. Uh, very often, the boundaries between these two types of work-based learning programs are blurred because they may present similar characteristics. However, variations uh, exist depending on the context in which they are implemented. Because, uh, for example, apprenticeships uh, may vary in their uh, length, in the salary, or in the types of occupations covered. And this is also why a single and standardized definition of uh, these two types of work-based learning programs uh, doesn't exist, and uh, different countries tend to use different terminologies. In any case, work-based learning, and in particular apprenticeships on which we uh, will focus our attention in this webinar, uh, represent an effective means to uh, drive the skilling of uh, the workforce and also to uh, reduce the risk of unemployment. This is why it is extremely important that uh, the promotion of work-based learning is done by applying a gender lens, a gender perspective, so that both women and men can have access uh, mm, uh, can have equal opportunities to assess uh, work-based learning and uh, uh, take advantage of its benefits. However, as we are going to see in this webinar, much still needs to be done to achieve gender equality. Uh, in this regard, we can have a look at some data to start uh, mapping the landscape of women participation in, uh, in work-based learning. In particular, we are considering apprenticeships. Uh, unfortunately, collecting data on women participation in work-based learning is uh, quite an exercise. And this because many countries, uh, uh, especially if you look at uh, ETF partner countries, uh, uh, lack a proper system of uh, uh, data collection, particularly with regard to sex disaggregated data. 
However, we were able to collect some figures for some of our partner countries and also for European countries, as you can see here. Uh, for the European countries, uh, this was possible thanks to the EU Labour Force Survey of uh, 2016, which showed how many graduates uh, experience work-based learning as part of their highest education attained, uh, particularly in VET and tertiary education. Uh, from the first graph, we can see uh, that uh, among graduates with medium-level vocational uh, education, uh, the majority of those who uh, had a work-based learning experience are uh, male. In this, among the, indeed, among uh, those who went through an apprenticeship, uh, the share of male is estimated at 59% compared to 31% of women, uh, while among those who uh, had a friendship, uh, the share of male is at around 55%, while the share for female, 45%. Uh, this gender gap is less pronounced if we look uh, at uh, um, tertiary education, uh, because uh, we can see uh, that among those who went through an apprenticeship, the share of male in this case is 51% compared to 49% for uh, uh, female, while for friendship we have actually a higher share of uh, uh, female, 61%, versus a share of male that is estimated at around 39%. Uh, uh, for ETF partner countries, we have some data, as you can see here, for uh, Morocco and Tunisia, which uh, are two countries where there is a quite good participation of uh, women in uh, apprenticeships, uh, because according uh, to the latest data, we can see uh, that for Morocco, uh, we have 46% of apprentices that were women in 2015 and 16, while for Tunisia, 38% of apprentices were female in 2018. Uh, we have also Egypt, Egypt where uh, different uh, uh, apprenticeship schemes are offered, and we can see that here there is a considerably lower participation of women. Uh, we, we, we see 10% in industrial apprenticeships, only 6% in integrated schemes, and uh, a greater number, 30% in short-term apprenticeships. Uh, last, we have also some figures for Kazakhstan, in which we can see that we have, again, almost 39% of students that were female in dual education in 2019. So what we can say by looking at this data is that there is no hard evidence available that this, there is a, a serious gap uh, between female and male participation in work-based learning. But what emerged from our research is that in every geographical context, there are specific factors that make it more difficult for women to have access to apprenticeships and also that women continue to be uh, mainly role in uh, specific sectors. There are those that are considered traditionally more female. So that's related to uh, food, beauty, and uh, social care services, and the so-called HID occupations, meaning uh, health, early education, and domestic roles, while they are heavily underrepresented in uh, STEM-related apprenticeships. So that's in uh, science, technology, engineering, uh, uh, and mathematics sector. And this actually reflects and continues to feed in a vicious circle what is called the horizontal and occupational segregation of women in the labor market, meaning that women are uh, overrepresented in that sector that usually offer lower pay of rates, that have a lower status, and uh, also that offer weak uh, opportunities for career progression. And this, of course, contributes significantly to the gender pay gap. Uh, moreover, we have to consider that women also have to deal with the so-called vertical segregations, uh, meaning that other than being concentrated in specific sectors, within these sectors, they are also underrepresented in uh, senior and management position. So, uh, for instance, if we take the example of a school, in this case, the majority of the school heads mm, will be men and the majority of teachers uh, women. So having said that, we uh, try to understand which are these barriers. Um, that make it more difficult for women to access apprenticeships. We found out that there are specific factors that you can see here, and now we are going to examine uh, in a more, bit more detail, and that these factors affect women uh, in every geographical area, so from the most developed to developing countries. So the first uh, element to consider uh, are stereotypes, gender roles, and laws. Um, this because stereotypes and traditional gender roles uh, uh, heavily affect society all around the world and they uh, negatively affect women uh, training and occupational choices. And this because according to these stereotypes uh, and these gender roles, 
women are considered to be suitable only for specific occupations, while they are not considered to be strong and skilled enough to uh, have access to other sectors, especially uh, the manufacturing, the ICT construction, and the engineering sectors that often are male dominated and are also more productive and better paid. Uh, and this, of course, may lead women to lose confidence in themselves and see their job possibilities very limited. Moreover, in some countries, there are also some national laws. For example, if uh, uh, we think of our partner countries, these happen in uh, uh, Kazakhstan, in Egypt, or also Moldova and Belarus. Uh, there are specific national laws that legally prohibit women to uh, have access to some occupations. And this because there are some jobs that are considered to be too uh, dangerous and physically demanding to be performed by uh, female workers. Uh, a second element uh, is related to gender bias career guidance uh, services, uh, because uh, unfortunately in many countries, uh, career guidance is not well uh, developed. So uh, young people tend to make uh, their training and educational choices based on a very limited information they have uh, about their uh, apprenticeships options. And then most of the time, are gender biased. Uh, moreover, a stereotype perception of uh, occupations may be also be reinforced over time by teachers, trainers, uh, and above all by parents that uh, represent a key influence on young people's career choices but that most of the time are not well prepared to give advice to their children about their career options and um, possibilities. And uh, the absence of uh, a gender sensitive and aware career guidance is actually one of the reasons why uh, many girls and women found themselves making choices that do not reflect their true uh, ambitions and aspirations. Then another problem is related to the work environment and commuting distances. Uh, this because the presence of an intimidating working environment and the fear of uh, gender-based violence can act as a grain constraint for women to apply to an apprenticeship. So, um, this is especially true when women decide to apply to uh, apprenticeships in uh, male-dominated sectors, because uh, in this case they may be afraid of facing uh, violence uh, in the form of uh, bullying or physical and psychological aggression or sexual harassment both in the workplace and uh, in the school environment uh, by their uh, teacher, the trainers, the employers, and even their uh, male fellow apprentices. Uh, this is even more true when uh, there is a lack of gender sensitive uh, infrastructures and uh, facilities that can protect women from abuse. Uh, moreover, uh, there is uh, the issue of transportation because uh, long distances between uh, the women's home and the place of training uh, can expose uh, them to a greater risk of facing abuse. And this is especially true uh, for developing countries uh, uh, in which, unfortunately, uh, particularly if you look at rural uh, areas, safe transportation is not always uh, guaranteed. Another major barrier is represented by uh, the work-life balance problem. Uh, this is because, unfortunately, in our society, women are still considered to be uh, the main responsible for uh, the majority of the domestic and care work, while men are thus perceived to be the financial providers of uh, the family. And this, of course, uh, poses a great burden on women that have less possibilities to, uh, compared to women to apply to a, a work-based learning uh, program. Uh, this is especially true when um, there is a lack of uh, uh, social protection measures, for example, maternity and paternity leave or uh, social care service, um, child care services that can protect, uh, can support women, and also because of a lack of flexibility of the of, uh, apprenticeship uh, program. What happened is that uh, being unable to find a balance between their career aspiration and uh, their household responsibilities, uh, many women found uh, themselves forced to refrain from applying to an apprenticeship or even to quit the program early. Uh, but actually, quitting a program early can have uh, negative long lasting consequences because uh, this can seriously undermine the long term financial well being. Other two uh, main uh, problems are. Uh, the range of apprenticeship occupations, uh, because in many countries uh, we found out that the range of uh, occupations where uh, apprenticeships are available is uh, often limited and uh, uh, mainly concentrated uh, around uh, traditional trades that usually are male dominated, uh, therefore discouraging women from applying. Uh, moreover, uh, research shows that uh, women are more likely um, to uh, drop out from uh, these programs uh, because they may face uh, or anticipate discrimination or suffer from hostile environment. Uh, 
uh, there is a recent, uh, a recent UNESCO UNEVOC report of 2020 uh, that shows that men, uh, women are more likely to drop out from STEM related apprenticeships and that very often they don't end up working in the relevant occupation after graduating in this field. Last but not least, uh, there is the problem of financial cost uh, because in some cases, uh, women may be unable to uh, pay uh, the fee requested to uh, take part in an apprenticeship or to uh, face expensive in to travel to the place of training. So these are the main barriers that affect women, uh, as we say, in every geographical context. Uh, then we, find, we try to find out which are the best uh, solution that can be uh, promoted to overcome this barrier and that uh, have proved to be successful in uh, supporting women. And uh, actually when implemented, this measure can really bring positive results as we are also going to see uh, later on with the presentation of the, the two case studies of Angola and Albania. Uh, so a first solution uh, is to ensure uh, lifelong gender sensitive career guidance. Uh, uh, we, saw, uh, we saw that gender the career guidance services can really help uh, uh, young people to reflect on their uh, skills, on their opportunities, and on, on their aspirations. And uh, uh, gender sensitive career guidance can even empower them to uh, break out of oppressive stereotypes based on gender that can limit their uh, choices. When applying this measure, uh, in order to make it uh, really effective, it is important to take into account three uh, major uh, elements. That uh, gender sensitive career guidance should start early because uh, uh, stereotypes are interiorized at a very early stage in life. Uh, research shows that the concept of gender takes root in children between the age of three and seven, and that by the age of uh, seven and eight, uh, young girls have already been negatively affected by gendered interactions. Second, uh, it should be guaranteed an adequate uh, number of uh, um, female career guidance coaches so that young girls and women may feel uh, confident and safe in asking advice to them. And also that gender sensitive career guidance should target uh, parents of the learners because we saw that most of the time they have uh, outdated and gender um, biased understanding of uh, apprenticeships programs. Together with gender sensitive career guidance, it's also important to uh, ensure uh, gender sensitive teaching, uh, con uh, teaching uh, method and learning uh, content uh, among the teaching staff and also uh, guarantee a, a balanced composition of the teaching staff by gender uh, to represent different roles of uh, femininity and masculinity. A second important uh, solution is to promote the use of female role models. Uh, in it, we found out that uh, in many countries, other than a lack of uh, gender sensitive career guidance, uh, there is a lack of uh, female role models uh, to whom girls can aspire. But it has been proved that uh, having the possibility to uh, listen to the stories of uh, successful women or to interact with them uh, can uh, really have a great impact on uh, female apprentices. Uh, this uh, measure can be, for example, uh, implemented by uh, inviting uh, females that have succeeded in different occupations in class uh, during the school-based component of the training, um, or also publicizing uh, positive images or female, of a female apprentice. Uh, this measure is also actually uh, effective in uh, tackling the lack of uh, support of parents towards female participation in apprenticeships because uh, having the possibility to listen to the stories of successful uh, uh, female apprentices or uh, having the possibility to visit companies that offer apprenticeships to women can help uh, uh, parents to change their perspective of uh, uh, work-based learning and uh, uh, become aware of the benefits that women access to work-based learning can uh, bring. Mm, third, it is uh, uh, extremely important that schools uh, promote uh, partnership with inclusive companies. So uh, with companies that value and uh, um, promote gender diversity in their program, and that, for instance, don't use uh, uh, discriminatory recruitment processes. Um, moreover, uh, the school staff should work with employers to uh, raise awareness among uh, women, girls, uh, their families, and the community as a whole uh, on the importance of uh, guarantee women access to the world of work uh, by, for example, organizing uh, information days or promotional events in school or offering the possibility to visit uh, uh, companies uh, uh, offering apprenticeships. 
um, another measure that has proved to be particularly successful is uh, to offer flexible apprenticeships programs. Uh, we saw that uh, family responsibility uh, represents uh, a great burden for women. And uh, this is especially uh, true uh, in the uh, present days because we saw that the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, have had their uh, worst uh, consequences on uh, impact on the female population. Uh, many women have found themselves forced to uh, take time off from work or even to quit their jobs. Uh, therefore, offering the possibility to have flexible working hours or uh, the possibility to telework during uh, the workplace uh, training component of uh, an apprenticeship can be a valuable solution to tackle this kind of uh, problem. Uh, this measure can be also integrated by uh, inc uh, introducing female-friendly policies related to the workplace, uh, guaranteed, for example, access to uh, affordable childcare services or uh, uh, introducing uh, parental and family leaves to uh, care for members of the families or children when needed. Uh, another uh, solution is, uh, for example, to set targets and provide uh, financial uh, uh, incentives to uh, female apprentices or uh, employers that are committed to recruit more uh, female among their apprentices, uh, for example, in the form of uh, tax exemption or uh, cash grants. And uh, other two solutions, are uh, offering female pre and post uh, apprenticeship programs. And this uh, uh, because uh, many apprenticeships may have some eligibility criteria for admission that may limit the access of uh, uh, disadvantaged youth, uh, including women. Uh, it has proved that it has been proved that offering pre apprenticeships uh, uh, programs exclusively to women can uh, support them in uh, develop uh, basic and non-academic skills uh, uh, that can help them to uh, become uh, competitive candidates for these programs. Um, these can be also follow up by tutoring uh, programs uh, to kick off the career of uh, female in a specific uh, sector or occupation, uh, specifically, uh, um, especially in those in which they are uh, heavily underrepresented. A last uh, very important measure is uh, uh, concerned the improvement of the monitoring and evaluation uh, system of apprenticeships. Uh, we saw that many countries still uh, lack proper system of uh, uh, monitoring data collection, uh, while it is extremely uh, important that schools and uh, organizations offering uh, um, apprenticeships commit themselves to uh, collect, monitor, and publish the number of their apprentices with all the relevant data uh, disaggregated by sex, and that they constantly evaluate their uh, learning programs offer. And this uh, because only if we have sex disaggregated data, we can understand which are the uh, issues that impact uh, disproportionately uh, women, and therefore design uh, gender responsive uh, measures and policies that can uh, be uh, effective and uh, impactful. So from my side, that's all. Uh, but uh, before leaving you, uh, I would like to, um, why I can't, uh, okay. I uh, would like to uh, ask you um, just a quick question. So, um, I would like to ask you which of the ones that I mentioned during the presentation, uh, according to you, are the three main barriers uh, hindering women participation in uh, work-based learning in your countries? Okay, I'll leave you some time to reply. Okay, still some seconds because I see you are replying. Okay. Just a few seconds more. Okay, let's see the results. Okay, so it seems that stereotypes and traditional gender roles are the major barrier, uh, and this actually affects society, as we say, all around the world. So yes, it is one of the main uh, factors that negatively affect women. Then we have the problem of work-life balance that 
in any case, is still related to uh, the problem of traditional gender roles. Uh, also, uh, some of you mentioned the gender bias career guidance services that should be uh, really uh, developed more to help people to reflect on their opportunities. And then we have also limited choice of apprenticeships occupations, lack of gender sensitive work environment. The last is the financial cost. Okay, so from my side, that's all. Maybe we can also discuss a bit more about it in, uh, later on in the Q&A session if you want or if you want to bring your experience, I think it will be interesting for all of us. And now I interrupt the individual, okay. Okay, so thank you. I let the floor to Valentina. Fabiana, thank you <laughs> for this extensive analysis and uh, the, the huge work you have done and very interesting facts from my point of view, at least. So thank you very much for your contribution. Um, as we mentioned already, I would like to uh, move on to the two case studies that basically are uh, using some of the tools that you have uh, already introduced. And the case study from, uh, from Borana Bariami, again, uh, we already announced her, uh, Line Manager World Based Learning with Skills for Jobs. Uh, she will tell us uh, her experience and the case study from Albania and how women are uh, accessing world-based learning from uh, her side. So if you want, Borana, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you, Valentina. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity of sharing the Albania case uh, on uh, work-based learning and uh, engagement of, uh, of girls in uh, work-based learning. If you can share the video, uh, Valentina, uh, it will be... Uh, of nice course, I will do it. Thank you. So let's, let's watch this uh, video from uh, Borana. Just a second, I will project it. Për qej shumë ambjente të shkollës, laboratorët ku kemi mundësit të praktikojmë ato që mësojmë në klasë, dihem shumë mirë me mësojësit dhe njërëzit që më rëthojmë. Një tjetër pasion e imi, përveç informatikës, e shetë e grafik dizajni. Këtë pasion që unë kam, jam duke zhvilluar edhe të praktika, të biznesi, në tima, të timaku. Tash më kam tre muaj që po e zhvilluar e praktika në atje, edhe për nërja kompanis më ka thënë që pasit të mbaroj shkollën, tani që e më dhëtë, mund të zhvilluar edhe punë në atje. me dhe pasionin e ndrën dhe mundësin për të realizuar atë. Thank you, Valentina. I think that there were some disconnections, but for the major part it works. Okay, let me look. Share the screen. Is it okay? Yes, 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 we can see. Uh, okay, uh, Skills for Jobs uh, is a, a skills development project uh, aiming in um, um, skills development of uh, young uh, girls and uh, boys uh, enrolled in that and studying in that uh, through uh, major initiatives and uh, activities, but uh, mostly, of course, uh, through engaging in uh, work-based learning. Uh, the situation in Albania before uh, uh, skills for jobs and by uh, 2016 uh, 
in regard to uh, girls, uh, we faced low enrollments of girls in VET in all profiles and professions. Uh, typically, in technical directions, uh, there were less uh, girls included in, uh, of course, in uh, technical directions, but mostly in work based learning. A uh, few companies. Uh, Offering were offering work based learning and had gender gender barriers uh, hosting mostly boys and uh, very few companies uh, offering work uh, apprenticeships were engaged uh, in hosting girls only for some specific gender oriented tasks that like cleaning organizing uh, coordinating and uh, they. Uh, the girls were placed in back office and not uh, in front office. Uh, we had some community prejudice you know, from parents and families from rural uh, areas that were afraid to send girls in vet schools due to uh, low perception of uh, image uh, of her uh, quality of the institutions and uh, fem uh, female friendly amenities. Uh, due to this prejudice, parents were concerned, of course, on uh, transportation issues because they were uh, families and parents from rural areas and uh, there were some uh, accessibility and uh, distance issues. Uh, these challenges and barriers uh, were mostly um, centered um, in changing the mindset of girls towards that uh, why do girls uh, not enrolled or why uh, are not choosing that? Uh, girl representations uh, were uh, was very low. Uh, changing parents' mentality towards that uh, was another issue. And uh, of course, we will uh, we were aiming for more girls in technical and different profiles and professions. Uh, work-based learning quality. Uh, of course, there were some changes, the challenges in placements of girls in uh, adequate uh, functions and posts, and uh, raising self-awareness through uh, work-based learning uh, was a, a barrier for many girls. Uh, here we have a picture of a girl uh, studying electronics. Uh, transforming challenges into opportunities. Uh, we had a motto here in Skills for Jobs. Uh, gender equality is not uh, an ideological problem, but mostly an economical uh, problem. So uh, we have done some activities and interventions uh, for recruitment and promotions of girls, uh, for career orientation, counseling and education. Um, for case management in work-based learning uh, through uh, analyzing different aspects in uh, placements and rotation of posts in uh, apprenticeships and uh, work-based learning in, in general, uh, through institutional responsibility and um, infrastructure improvements. Uh, some interventions and activities uh, related to um, to girls' enrollment and uh, girls' uh, engagement in different aspects uh, were uh, girls' representation in lucrative uh, professions, and uh, we have organized a big campaign, Meet Every Girl campaign, to increase enrollment in uh, vet schools and institutions. Uh, we uh, organized some activities in schools uh, involving girls from primary schools and exposing them to uh, competitions between uh, in uh, some areas like coding uh, pro projects, uh, practical training, ICD bootcamp for, uh, for girls, um, supported by many companies and hosting companies uh, for apprenticeships and work-based learning. Uh, more girls are enrolled in, in ICT. Um, competition led by partner companies um, like Code like a, like a Girl by Vodafone, a Hackathon, uh, Digital Girls of Digital Girl of the Year, etc., were some competition that attract uh, more girls, and uh, they have 
they have more uh, awareness on their uh, skills and uh, development in the future. Uh, selective collaboration with uh, women in business association and organizing storytelling by business women uh, as a role model, uh, Fabiana mentioned it, and career orientation and entrepreneurship were some of the activities uh, that uh, were uh, that were uh, implemented by the project to uh, to give the, uh, some very good models of uh, working and selecting uh, appropriate career. Uh, quality of work based learning, more companies are on board for qualitative uh, apprenticeships, uh, ensuring rotation of girls in different posts um, as per uh, their practical plan. Uh, improve case management. Uh, this is um, um, awareness campaign about gender bias in task assigned uh, assignment in work-based learning. As before mentioned, uh, as a challenge uh, that most companies uh, were um, were not very happy to uh, to host uh, girls in in similar uh, posts for for boys and girls. Uh, they have prejudice on on uh, genders. Uh, fem, fem, uh, female friendly uh, mentees uh, in uh, industrial school, for example, uh, we have invested in infrastructure also. Some challenges uh, that we faced in during uh, 2016 and uh, 2000. Uh, uh, 2019 were uh, addressed in uh, school mindset changing in orienting girls towards well-paid programs and professions in career orientation, uh, changing schools mindsets in orienting girls towards well-paid uh, programs in institutional marketing through promoting uh, like promoting girls that were uh, successful in work-based learning and uh, uh, specific professions. Capacity building of gender uh, coordinator in the schools uh, with clear instruction, inst institutional objective in ensuring uh, gender inclusion, uh, like annual gender events, and uh, inclusion of girls in marketing groups uh, visiting the ninth uh, grade classes with the aim of endorsing girls in targeted professions and promoting them during uh, their journey in the school and work-based learning. Uh, these were uh, mostly what uh, skills for jobs um, as a skills development project uh, addressed during uh, um, the, the first phase of the project, but we will continue through, uh, through uh, addressing uh, the challenges um, that Fabiana and, uh, uh, of course, uh, all the countries, uh, I think, have in, in common uh, in uh, breaking this prejudice, uh, gender bias, uh, and uh, community. Um, Bridget dies. The video we saw at the beginning, so that was all from our side. Thank you, Barana. Thank you very much for uh, Thank you. for for illustrating to us uh, your experience and your case study from Albania. Uh, have re we have received some uh, some questions for you privately, so later I can't wait to have the the discussion space to to address those questions to you and to Fabiana as well. Uh, now it's uh, time to to hear our second case study. This time from Angola, so a different experience, and let's see how uh, women access work based learning uh, processes in Angola with uh, Evaristo Waya. The senior partnership officer from ADPP, 
from Angola. Um, we'll be hearing from, uh, we'll be watching a video from him as well to see uh, uh, the experience in Angola. So first of all, uh, Evaristo, if you want to take the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valentina. Good afternoon to all participants. And thank you for inviting us to take part in this webinar where we have a chance to present our experience on women in action in Angola based on the vocational training and the entrepreneurship. So as I said, is a, the initiative is implemented by ADPP, Angola. ADPP stands for Ajuda de Desenvolvimento de Povo para Povo, or Development Aid from People to People, which is started 35 years ago with the focus on development sector, education, health, agriculture, and the integrated projects. To say that uh, education is the biggest intervention for ADPP Angola with the teacher trainings and also with the providing education for young people. The ADPP also is a member of uh, Humana People to People uh, Federation. Uh, before going to the going further to the context of the Women in Action projects, I would like to share with you some barriers to the women economic empowerment in Angola that are related to the, to the projects. As we can see from this fact, we can see that uh, education is one of the biggest barriers. We see that the average years of schooling is 4.9 for women and 7.2 for the male. So here we see the significant discrepancy from the women compared with the, with the men. And also we see that the literacy rates is also affecting more the, the women or where we have a 53% for the women and also eight for the men. For the men. And the, fer the fertility rate is very high. It's the second uh, highest in Africa. And also it also is mean that uh, our approach with the reproductive health as a transversal approach in the program is very important. And also at the same time also we see a very young population we can see that 66% six, of the population are 25 or under. And then uh, as I say, as I'm saying, the education is uh, one of the biggest challenge. We see that also poor availability of technical and vocational training at lower level. And also this is more, become more complicated because of the economic crisis that Angola is facing since 2014 with the limited resource for the government to provide training and safe education. And this globally also COVID-19 pandemic is also challenging on the institutional and individual level. So based on this context, the basis of the project is to empower the women with the practical skills and support them to start their own enterprise at the same time as they can take care of their family responsibilities and also promote economic and social inclusion. So as we are saying, the focus of the project is to empower the, the women socially and also economically, and also that they can continue their, their normal activities. So uh, about the ADPP Women in Action project, the aim is to enable women to establish and grow their own small business in their telling center. So for this part of the program, they have uh, the women, when they are in the program, they have six months sewing course where they learn to sew new or add value to use the clothing. And also they have uh, six months for entrepreneurship training where they are helping to, to create and follow up full business plan marketing assistance and also joint sales event. Here we can say also that one of the, the biggest exam, the, the example for joining sales event is that when there is a fairs, for example, that are organized by the, the company or by the governments, 
the women are invited to promote their 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 products and also to have connection to the, to the markets. And one of the important periods, which also take take six months, is the incubation periods, where the individual support, where the women get the individual support to start and to grow macro enterprise, access to selling machine, and also to start their own production. And uh, we can see that the project is a uh, 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 is, is uh, in five provinces in Angola, which is uh, in Cabinda from 2016, and then in Bengu from the period of 2016-2018. And also there is a uh, three location in, in Luanda province with the participation of 1,399 participants. And then we are, we are also in the, the province of Huila and Namibia. In terms of the, the project also on the recruitment, the, 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 most, the, the most important requirement is that should be the women above 18 years old who demonstrate entrepreneurial spirit and also who have uh, social and economic, economic vulnerability. And then the course is also designed so that it can fit to the profile of the, of the, of the women to follow them in addition to child care, informal work. And uh, according to the, the impact of the program along, along these uh, this years, this period, we can see that there are many more women who are looking for this kind of program. For example, recently uh, we had 200 35 five applicants for 50 plus. And also one of the things I want to highlight is the local partnerships where we get donation of material, contracts to the producer, for example, for the, mask, the face mask. Here I, wa I want to, to, to highlight that uh, when Angola uh, first, the first, uh, uh, when Angola started the period of uh, COVID, it is enough. Uh, the women who are part of the program, they are the ones who started to make the, the face mask as a contribution to the, to the protection of the COVID-19, but at the same time as a way of earning money for their uh, economic, uh, for their economy. So, and also we have, uh, we want to, to highlight the, the, the connection that with bank, because also the banks also, they make uh, uh, programs with the programs, for example, with the uh, uh, financial literacy, where also the student, the, the participant, they 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 learn more about the economy and also about the about the the financial literacy. And also, we want to highlight the part, institutional partnership with the Minister of Social Action, Family and Women, where the the ministry is training the women on uh, family competence. It means that you also, beside of the normal course on tiling, also they get uh, some transversal approach like uh, these uh, family competencies. It's a, 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 a holistic package with the uh, water and sanitation, nutrition, vaccination, and all those issues that the women, they should know how to deal with. And then in terms of uh, results, we can see that from, for this program, we have so far reached 1,099 women are trained in the four provinces, mixed with the urban and peri-urban area. And then we have uh, 1,060 women who have successfully established a business. So the most important output of the program is that after the training, the, the women, they can establish their, their business and they improve their own income. And also we can see that uh, 613 have purchased their own sewing machine. So during the program, the, the, the participants, they get access to the machine in the center. And also at the same time, they, 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 they have to make it to, to have production, to have saving for their, for their, for their machine. Here we can see that 600, they have got their, their machines. So in terms of the, the impact, uh, 
look at the uh, external evaluation from 2019, which is which was made in one of the site implementation area, concluded that the women have been empowered and now have a significantly better life for themselves and for their children, and both economic and social in terms as reflected in the following impact. So here we can see some of uh, the, the indicator from this, uh, this uh, external evaluation, where I would like to highlight the number of uh, women successfully completing the course, which was uh, 297. And then I want to highlight that uh, uh, also 86% of the participants were because of the effort from the projects, also they succeed to get their ID, ID cards. And with this, they can get access for, to, to other services. And also 70% of bank accounts in their own name and are using them. So these are the good indicator for them to have access to other to other market opportunities. And also I want to highlight that 94% uh, uh, have a stable income from their enterprise for at least 12 months after completing the, the project. So it's mean that this figure shows that we, with the projects, the women, they can start, they can start to improve their income. They increase the, their income and also they, they improve their household expenditure. And also one of the important things is that they learn along the program how to work together. As we can see also, um, here we can see that uh, more people, they are willing to teach other women or to have solidarity to, 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 to give, uh, to train other people and also how to work together. And uh, about the, the future, our perspective is to replicate the, the model for, okay, for other vocational training and also to increase the private sector linkage. Where this program is, uh, is having a good uh, linkage with the private sector, and then we want to, to find new public and the private sector as a part of the program. So I will let uh, Valentine to to break the video so you can hear some voice from the from the ground from the the women themselves thank okay you. thank you everybody so thank you i'm going to share the screen with the video just hold on a second okay Olá, chamo Lorina Matanto, formando já graduada do quarto grupo do projeto Mulheres em Ação Benguela. O meu plano de negócio é de criar um ateliê organizado e também colocar em prática tudo o que eu aprendi na formação e também para o sustento da minha família. O dinheiro que eu irei ganhar, uma parte vai para casa e a outra parte eu farei poupança para poder comprar uma outra máquina né? e também entregar outras mulheres que precisam de ajuda. A parte da formação que foi mais útil para mim no curso de empreendedorismo foi quando aprendemos a fazer o plano de produção, controle de venda e o plano de negócio. Enquanto costura que eu mais gostei foi quando eu aprendi a dominar a máquina, aprendi também os diferentes cortes e moldes. Enfim, quero agradecer ao Simpan, ao projeto Mulheres em Ação e também à DPP. Obrigada. Well, that was great. Thank you very much, Arisa, for your uh, for your case study for for illustrating this to us. I wish I had participated to the sewing course myself. It sounded very interesting. And um, well, now moving on, uh, we have our first Q&A space uh, as already announced. Uh, I will bring in uh, Fabiana for some assistance on this part. Uh, I know that you have received some questions already, right? Yes. 
Okay, let's start with the questions. And I remind all of you that if you want to uh, speak in person and like address your questions uh, uh, in person, you can also uh, click the button in the bottom bar of your screen, reactions, and then raise your hand. And if I see raised hands, uh, I will just turn on your microphones and you can address the questions yourself. Thank you. Go on, uh, Fabiana, all yours. See, so I have a question for Evaristo about the Angola project. Uh, so Evaristo, we ask you, what is uh, the level of education of women and their profile? I mean, of women that are taking part in the, in the program. What's uh, their level of education, more or less, they are asking? But so you can. Uh, I can answer now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, Fabiana. Uh, first of all, as I was highlighted in my presentation, one of the biggest challenge in Angola for the women is the education. So when we are for the profile, the ba the basic, the basic requirement is that should they have eight grades of education, and then uh, uh, she has to have ability on writing and also spoken in, in, a, in, a, in a Portuguese or communication skills. Okay. Yeah, but of course, as the, as the education is, uh, it's not always possible to go for this. What we do is that we have also some special program for the women who are very behind in terms of education. And also the follow-up that we do in incubation periods also make more, more, make more, it is a more concrete uh, uh, approach to the, to the individual women. Yeah, indeed, actually, we have also a question about uh, this. I mean, they ask, how do you follow up women after the completion of uh, the program? After the, during the program, when they at the, the center, also they organize in small groups. For example, three to five members are part of one group. And then when they go for the incubation periods, also they have uh, the trainer who is following them at home to help them to start the process of uh, establishing their own business. So it, it's during this uh, period where they get more precise um, follow-up individual. Okay, thanks, Evaristo. Uh, we have another question that is general, so I don't know if you, Evaristo, or Borana would like to reply. Uh, so uh, the question is, how can we guarantee effective gender inclusion if the evaluation and uh, the monitoring of the process are in the hands of men who are either consciously or unconsciously biased by their privileges? So, you can, I don't know if Borana or you would like to tell us something more about the monitoring process. Who, um, or maybe Borana for, uh, um, if you can tell us something about, uh, yeah, the monitoring of your program. Yes, it's, it's, not also you... our, uh, it's not our case actually, because mentors in companies uh, that are evaluating and monitoring are both female and male. Okay. So. So to guarantee an equal participation of women and men, so that we can uh, have uh, the representation of, um, yeah, I mean, an equal representation of uh, uh, men and women. So I don't know if uh, the other participants in the meanwhile. I, uh, Fabiana, Sorry. I just yes. want to add that uh, in our case, uh, the folks and the women, but of course we also, when we are on the follow-up periods, also the family has to be part because yeah. they have to understand the, the whole idea is to improve the family economy. Sure, thanks. I don't know if the, also in the meanwhile others, the participant want to ask some question by raising uh, your hand. Or if uh, we can go on with the other presentation. Yes, in any case, Fabiana, uh, we have a second Q&A space, so if anyone wants to address any question later, they can do it. I will go on with uh, our next speakers, if you don't mind. So, 
um, yes. So now it's the is the second part of the of the of the session. As I mentioned already, senior project manager from CSS, and after him we will have uh, Irina Pushak. Uh, uh, also from CSCS uh, project manager, and they will uh, share with us uh, their um, self-assessment tools uh, in training for gender equality and gender inclusion. So I would just leave the floor to them. And uh, yes, please uh, tell us more about this. Thank you very much, Valentina. I will ask my colleague Irina to start to share our presentation. Uh, so I will. Uh, and take the floor at first, and then I will leave uh, Irina to go on uh, with the further details. Well, first of all, I enjoyed the presentations from Fabiana, from Borana, from Evaristo. Thank you very much. I can say that those projects uh, um, share uh, very similar approaches uh, uh, to the ones we are going to present. Uh, they are addressing similar issues, of course. Uh, only uh, I'd like to to, to have you to consider that our purpose in the projects I'm going to present uh, to you, which are uh, European Union Fund projects, um, uh, in those projects, our purpose is not only to ensure positive actions toward, uh, towards women, um, but also towards uh, men, uh, males, because we strongly believe that inequalities uh, cannot be overcome considering that only females are lacking of some things. Of course, a lot of cases they are, but men as well are lacking uh, of uh, transversal competencies or, or other opportunities. So uh, we have adopted in our project, uh, uh, let's say a, a broader uh, reference uh, uh, model. Um, um, yeah, this is just a representation of the fact that we are trying uh, to um, develop uh, self-assessment tools and guidances to organizations to address uh, the issues of their way to communicate and to be aware of the stereotypes they own. Um, so we have developed an approach to help organizations not only to help women, but instead to help themselves to create a non-discriminatory environment, no matter to your gender, okay? So adopting this approach, you will then design and implement positive actions toward uh, women, of, uh, of course, if the organization has a majority the representation of males, but also to uh, the opposite uh, example. For example, for um, those organizations in which uh, uh, there are so-called uh, traditional female uh, activities like early stage teaching in schools or in other institutions or key professions. The projects uh, that Irina is going to, to, to present, in fact, are uh, starting from uh, um, uh, a specific area of the organizations working with youth generally, and then we focused on uh, three subtopics. So the organizations, um, the educational organizations like schools and vocational training organizations, the universities, and also the sport sectors where youth are uh, a lot represented. But we think that this approach can help generally the, the uh, organizations of any kind which are supposed to be teaching organization to involve the youth in uh, learning. So of course, uh, our contribution should be also related to workplace uh, 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 learning. Uh, you can go on, uh, Irina, with our presentation. Uh, I'm not going to explain this, but just let's say that um, um, we are thinking about positive actions, uh, not only in terms of numbers, uh, but also uh, on how, for example, organizations communicate and how they represent themselves. So we have adopted the uh, first assessment tool where we are still developing. Uh, we are going to present it officially in an event uh, in the uh, first days of October um, on different areas uh, to help organizations to identify, to identify their uh, weaknesses uh, in terms of uh, uh, the gender approach and to better identify the stereotypes they have uh, adopted, even those they are unaware of. So what my colleague Irina is going to better present to you, and uh, I think that in the next slide, uh, Irina, we have a general presentation of uh, yeah the, the, this approach, is uh, a self-assessment tool, which is uh, uh, personalized to each area. So I was saying schools, universities, and the youth organizations. 
in order to have a set of questions and more uh, indicators personalized to the dimension, to the area, to the countries in which you are based, in order then to have, of course, some kind of scorings, but the most important thing is to have guidance and examples and also capacity building activities we are going to deliver uh, within uh, more some of those organizations. Um, so uh, while I'm leaving the floor to Irina to present a more detailed uh, aspects, please uh, remember that uh, she's going to present several uh, projects, but we are designing now a um, general website, which is gender balance dot eu where we are going to give you more and more updates in the following months so please stay tuned and uh, there is i think a subscription form we are uh, we have just delivered but please irina you can take the floor so that you can give more details to our colleagues yeah thank you very much fabio for such inspiring um intervention and the beginning so i will uh, i will go uh further in order to introduce you how actually self-assessment tool works in particular we have analyzed that this consists of the four uh stages first of all it's a stage of the self-assessment the self-assessment it's um we use uh, the website uh in the form of uh it's it's uh self-assessment tool in the form of the questionnaire that is focused on six areas of the self-assessment in particular it's human resources leadership coaching stereotypes in communication gender-based violence and participation in all of these areas uh different types of organization have a set of the question where they need to answer in different maneuvers so it could be a close-ended question or a questions with the options. And uh, after all, the, the, the algorithm, the, the formula that we have elaborated goes to evaluation. After the organization have has um, obtained the self-assessment, it gets the report with the results of the evaluation. It, it consists of the four stages. The pre-assessment level, so the, the, the level when uh, the tool analyzed that uh, organization um, have the minimum uh, requirements in order to go further and enter into the actual evaluation and get the, the certification. Afterward, we have a three, a three levels, so it's bronze level, silver, and gold, based on the different answer of the organization. So if it has a um, specific written state uh, organizational policy, or it has an informal meetings or more formal actions, based on all of those components, um, the, 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 the algorithm, the formula evaluates it and give the um, for each specific uh, self-assessment strategic area, give the results on the evaluation. Together with the evaluation, the organization got also the access to the database. That is specific also for the each specific area. So we gathered more than 200 resources for each type of the organization then that consists of best practices, tools, guidance, and uh, other different resources that aim to help organization to improve in each specific level and in each uh, specific area. It's also is personalized. So based on your level of the evaluation role or you are gold or you obtain at a gold level or a bronze, it gives you the specific number of the documents and the document that are, are really helpful exactly for your level of uh, gender equality within the organization and also uh, due to the type of your organization. Afterward, we have the awareness and improvement. So we can understand that some organization, not all will receive the, the bronze level uh, or gold level. So we give them the resources, we give them the time, we give them the actual tools, how to act, and then they are torn and serve. So they read in the resources, they implement them, and they act through the improvement in, in, inside the organization. The resources are available in uh, for different projects. They are available in five, at least five EU and non-EU languages. So it's um, broader uh, the, 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 the wide, the, the public that we can reach with our resources. Going a bit uh, detaily to the type of the organization that we are going to focus, we have, as Fabio have anticipated, 
uh, has anticipated, we have created the genderbalance.eu platform that covers basically three projects. First, that is focused on youth organization or youth workers or coaches, mentors who are working with youth. Then it's SWAS that is focused on the support uh, organization and FRISCO that will be released in March 2022. That is focused actually on the educational uh, institutions, the schools, universities, web providers, and have a specific, a specific path uh, how uh, to help them to approve. And also the, the project consists of different capacity building activities that we will provide it uh, once the organization will be registered. So basically uh, we invite you to go to the gender balance, uh, subscribe and enter to the line of the, of the organization that will be the first one who will test uh, the first uh, who will test uh, the different type, uh, uh, the tool. You can select by yourself the type of organization. You can select your uh, area where you work, etc. And based on that, you will receive from our part the, the email with the invitation and later instructions. Um, from my side, that's all. I hope I was quick and I reached in time. So thank you, thank you very much for, uh, for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Irina. Thank you, Fabio and Irina, for this intervention. Of course, uh, now we have a second space for more questions and more comments later on. If, uh, Irina, we have some spare time, maybe you can show us how to actually do it uh, like a small simulation of the tool. Let's see if we have enough time to do it. But I see we are a little bit in advance with time. So if we have the chance, uh, I would uh, ask Irina, just get ready just uh, a few minutes and later we will take this back this uh, the topic. Uh, Fayana, uh, see, Fayana. Fabiana, back to you <laughs> with the Q&A space. Uh, let's see if we have more questions for Fabian, and for Irina or for the previous speakers or anything we want to add to the table to the discussion. Um, I, uh, so far, I haven't received any questions. So uh, if some of you want to intervene, otherwise I have a question for the participants. If some of you want to reply i wanted to ask you uh, if uh, uh, do you have uh, like a tool or a system uh, similar to the one that uh, that's been presented by for example now by irina uh, to monitor in, to, to monitor gender discrimination against women in the programs you offer as an organization school uh, or a company if you have ever developed developed something like this especially if you offer like apprenticeship programs to I don't know if someone wanted to intervene, you can even just raise your hand without I, typing in the chat box. Fabiana, while the other participants uh, are thinking yes. about the questions, if I, if I may, um, um, of course, in those projects, uh, we are not starting from the scratch. Uh, and we have uh, taken inspirations from other European projects and other approaches. And I recommend uh, uh, all the participants to take a look to the a job done by the European Institute uh, from, uh, for Gender uh, Policies, uh, which are also presenting the, uh, in a very comprehensive way, the gender impact assessment, uh, which is a more comprehensive approach. Uh, uh, and I don't know if anybody has adopted it. It is very interesting, even if it is, think, uh, it is applicable mainly to greater organizations and um, large industries and public administrations. So if anybody else has uh, uh, examples of, uh, let's say more flexible and smaller tools, it is very interesting for us because uh, in our experience, uh, uh, there is a, a lack of uh, offers in these tools for smaller organizations, for uh, non, uh, not uh, uh, structured organizations. Usually you have self-assessment tools in which you have how many, I don't know, uh, uh, board members you have uh, in terms of male and female, how many uh, um, uh, policies uh, for job employment you have, but a lot of organizations, small organizations, but I'm thinking about uh, that and educations and schools. So it is very interesting if you have any other experiences, smaller tests uh, applicable to small organizations because it will source uh, our uh, project as well. And sorry, I take the opportunity to say 
uh, I, I forgot to mention that uh, it is nice if you can attend uh, the assessment because the more inputs we get in terms of feedbacks, the more uh, best practices and guidance we can deliver to the organization. Sorry, Fabian, I took uh, this. No, time. no, no, it's okay. So um, if no one wants to reply, maybe Irina can uh, show us how the tool works in case no one uh, is going to intervene. Or if you have any question, you don't have uh, to reply to my, <laughs> to my question. You can even done other. Ask other. Yes, Rina, I would be very interested to see how that works. Uh. So let's go. Basically, we can uh, generally we will have the possibility to select the language, but I will proceed in the in English. Is there any way that you can just make it bigger? Um, that now is better. Yes, better. Thank you. So in particular, you need to put like the basic information we need from you. It's the name of the organization, the type. I will show you on uh, on the, taking into consideration example of the was self-assessment tool that is created for now for the sport organization, youth organization, or informal group, groups of young people. And after what, we will need to also analyze the size of your organization. Uh, we'll need to get the, the uh, organization in numbers. So in particular, number of women and men that are in the leadership position, coaches, mentors, assistants. So uh, I will go like with the random numbers in order to go to the next tab because for now we have everything in the mandatory. I was not uh, ready to, um, to present it, but yeah. and. Um, yeah. Uh, just give me a second. Okay. Later on, we switch to the human resources management part, where as as we said before, we have a different type of the of the um, of the questions. Take into consideration the action that the organization implement on the um, on the formally basis of the written types of the written um, documents formally ex um, in implied in the organization. Also, some informal actions or uh, any other formal actions, but not written in the uh, organization policy or the st statute. Also, we have a different types of the of the response uh, also to adapt it to the organization that do not have these types of um, of the of the resources. For example, like uh, we have the question regarding the equal pay, the maternity and paternity leave, because we we consider that all the questions that uh, take into consideration women and men. Um, regarding it's general the question are uh, uh, those question are, uh, are focused on the human resources management then we have oops then we have the section regarding regarding the leadership position so it's aimed to analyze number of women and men in the um, broad terms all, also regarding the post equal possibility within the organization to to obtain the leadership positions uh, we ask our organization to, to select the most, um, the, the answer that are the most um, close to their reality. We have the section regarding the coaching and mentorship. Um, for example, what kind of action is taken to improve balance access for women and men to the coaching, mentoring and youth animation positions? Regarding the existing policies or recommendations, uh, any strategy strategies or the tools within the organizations. Later on, we have the section regarding stereotypes in communication activities. Here, we need to evaluate if the organization uh, treat equally women and men. To what is considered the, the communication? So, for example, if uh, in case if it's like any uh, any. Um, for example, what institution if they treat and have the equal representation of women and men in their promotion materials. Uh, 
We also have the gender-based violence section. This section actually uh, talks how the organization treat the situation concerned gender-based violence. Do the organization have formally implemented any prevention methods? And um, how uh, organization, uh, what action the uh, organization take in order to support, for example, victims of gender-based violence? That's uh, those, all those questions are very important in order to, to be honest in the evaluation process. Also we had the, the, in the section of the participation, it's uh, aimed to evaluate the balanced participation between women and men and uh, equal opportunities uh, for the participation for women and men. Uh, after what, we got the, the results. Uh, okay, my, my results are, are, too, are too good <laughs> because we have the, as you can see, we have the evaluation for each category. So for example, based on the human resources management category, uh, due to my responses, we get a well done level. So it uh, correspond to the silver one. And uh, you also have here the lean that will redirect you to the database that's focused only on human resources um, documents. You can, you can also filter it due to the, any condition you prefer, title, country, for example, let's see Portugal or uh, Italy. Later on, you have uh, the scores for a different section. You can see here we have the excellent um, and evaluation for a forage strategic area. After what, you receive the certificate. As you can see, we got the silver, silver level. It, that was a summary of all the resources that we got before. We have also the access to the full database with the, all the research that the organization can check due to the language, where you see the cattle, for example, English, and also to the strategic areas, and also download the, um, the actual certificate. So from my side, that's all. That's uh, end of uh, our self-assessment tool. Um, do you have any, any questions? Only Irina, just to mention that uh, the assessment tool is still in a uh, uh, design mode and the results uh, is, are going to be finalized in order to give better personalizations uh, of uh, the best practices and the database. So this is the part which is missing, of course, in the example you have uh, uh, shared, but in the forthcoming weeks and months, you will have a, a more comprehensive tool. So feel free to join again in uh, uh, let's say in a few weeks, correct, Irina? Exactly. Okay. Okay. Wow. Very interesting. I was uh, I was actually drawn to the screen to 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 follow the the, the whole process. So very interesting. I will I will go back to it later. Um, I would say, Fabiana, that we are at the at the end of uh, this session. Uh, unless there's anyone else who want to uh, add something, ask questions, or uh, anything else, any comments. Otherwise, I would um, I would just uh, come to the final conclusions and uh, you know, like the, the reflections that we can that we can draw from this uh, specific uh, event. Um, let me just uh, thank all the speakers for being here and for taking their time to participate and to share with us uh, your your practices. They're very inspiring, at least from my side. I, I, I really thank a lot Fabiana for your research and extensive work you've done. Uh, uh, Stefan from the European Training Foundation, you guys have uh, um, very, worked really hard on the topic. They have given us very um, interesting insights. Thank you very much. And uh, Fabiana, what do you think about what we just uh, said in, in this session? Or if uh, Stefan wants to add anything else, uh, I, I would just leave the, the space to you to do so. Yeah, maybe I can say just a few words to uh, sum up what we said and uh, conclude the webinar. Uh, so we saw during uh, this webinar what is work-based learning, which are its main forms, 
and that as uh, Borbezening as part of uh, uh, vocational education programs can uh, be an effective means to um, provide learners with relevant employability skills and therefore guarantee a smooth transition into the labor market. Uh, apprenticeships in particular uh, are usually associated with very positive uh, early employment outcomes, both in developed and developing countries. And uh, this is also why uh, work based learning is actually gaining increasing attention uh, around the world. And many countries have also started to reform their vet policies, uh, taking into account its uh, importance. Uh, despite this, uh, we saw that men and women are not uh, uh, equally enjoying the benefits of work based learning. Uh, because there are specific factors that make it more difficult for women to uh, ac have access and remain in uh, these programs. To sum up, we can say that these factors are mainly related to three major problems. We saw a problem of accessibility that can be related to social cultural factors. So we saw the role of uh, gender stereotypes uh, and uh, gender roles in uh, limiting uh, uh, women's possibility to access apprenticeships and uh, also the problem of uh, finding a um, work-life balance, problem of uh, the low attractiveness that uh, apprenticeships uh, have towards uh, women that uh, most of the time do not receive adequate information or proper career guidance services uh, to reflect on their opportunities uh, and uh, uh, aspirations. And also because of the negative perception that uh, uh, parents have towards women participation of uh, to uh, work-based learning. And the uh, last uh, major problem is uh, um, maybe the economic constraints because especially in developing countries, uh, women may be unable to uh, bear the cost associated to uh, apprenticeships. So uh, this is why it is extremely important uh, today that uh, to overcome this barrier, schools and uh, organization offering uh, apprenticeships try to be uh, more responsive towards women uh, needs and that they try to apply a gender lens when they develop and promote their apprenticeships programs. We saw some of the measures that can be uh, promoted to achieve this, uh, this uh, objective and that can actually uh, produce uh, very positive uh, results uh, as it has been demonstrated with the case studies of uh, Angola and uh, uh, Albania. And this considering that for many girls, work-based learning can really represent a crucial starting point on the path to sustain training and uh, employment. And uh, um, that guarantee a better access of women to work-based learning and consequently to the labor market can uh, bring benefits not only to women themselves, but also on the society as a whole. And this in terms of having a lower uh, your, uh, unemployment rates, higher level of productivity, and also more inclusive and uh, sustainable societies. And also bearing in mind that women represent half of uh, the world population. And if we uh, leave them uh, behind, it won't be possible to uh, achieve a sustainable develop um, uh, sustainable development for all and also to meet the sustainable development goals of the 2030 uh, UN agenda. So from my side, that's all. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I... Stefan, if you would. Yeah, thank you very much, Fabiana, Valentina. Uh, I don't have much to add. I uh, would like to say thank you to all uh, of the speakers. Um, we heard about two, let's say, uh, different uh, case studies from also very different parts of the world. I think very interesting and inspiring. I also would like to say thank you to Fabiana for um, presenting some um, uh, of the data. Um, I think you didn't mention that you also drafted a paper, a short paper, and that I paper will be beginning. disseminated um, with, um, with an email that Valentina will send to all of you. So thank you very much again also right. to the two speakers from Albania and Angola, to Borana and Evaristo, and of course also to uh, Irina and Fabio for presenting the, uh, the tool um, for self-assessing gender, I would say, sensitivity or gender equality. Last but not least, thank you to uh, Valentina and the team for providing the technical infrastructure uh, and uh, organizing this, uh, this event. Um, we are closing 15 minutes um, before the scheduled time, so I think this is also an achievement. Never um, happened in the history of webinars. The <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. I wish you all um, um, a nice afternoon.
Yes, uh, I would just yeah. like to remind all of you that all the materials of this webinar, including video and the presentations and the publication that Stefan just mentioned, will be sent to you by email and also published on the on the web page that I just wrote in the chat. So if you want to access the material, you're welcome. And in two days, we will have a training that I would like to talk about is a very interesting training on accessing direct grant funding programs. And it would be done in collaboration with uh, AER, the Assembly of European Regions. I know that it's a very uh, interesting topic for all, for, for many people. We have more than 100 registrants so far. So I would just like to send the invitation to you as well in case you're interested to participate. Um, that would be all from my side, Stefan. If you want, uh, we can just uh, close the room and wish every, everybody to have a good day, good night, good evening. Thank you very much for participating. I will leave you uh, with uh, these last uh, remarks uh, for today. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.